war was over. In 1918, German soldiers, young men who'd seen death up close, who came close to meeting death themselves, came home. Alive, but defeated. One of those men was a Czech officer named Hans Janowitz. Born and raised in Prague, he'd already had some experience with the darker side of human nature. He once witnessed a murder at a park, and later, at the girl's funeral, saw the killer casually standing among the mourners. Back from the trenches, he settled in Berlin, where he met a man who shared his hate for absolute authority, for a power that would knowingly send millions to their doom. This man was Karl Mayer, an Austrian who, at 16, was forced to live on the streets with his three younger brothers after his father had gambled away his business, threw them out of the house, and committed suicide. Mayer took whatever jobs he could, but eventually found his way into the theater. During the war, he would be assigned a high-ranking military psychiatrist for his mental conditions. This would make quite an impression on him. Janowitz and Mayer quickly became friends. They bonded over movies, spending hours discussing and debating how their revolutionary views could be shown on screen. One night, on one of their city strolls, they found themselves walking into a fair. Bright lights, strange music, archaic attractions, intoxicating to the two young men. It was on that night that an idea was born. Mayer pulled Janowitz over to an exhibit, where a huge beast of a man performed incredible feats of strength. But what struck the two would-be artists was that as he lifted these machines over his head, he acted as though he were hypnotized, uttering phrases that, to the awestruck crowd, almost seemed like dark prophecies of the future. Something clicked. All the images and ideas that had been brewing in their minds were joined together by this one night out to form a single story. It would take them the next six weeks to write the script. In the end, all that was missing was a name for their lead character, a psychiatrist very much like Mayer's bitter enemy during the war. While skimming through some obscure book, Janowitz paused. One name leaped out. Caligari. You might have heard of it, or even seen it, but why is this movie so popular? Why do filmmakers today still look back on it for inspiration? I know when I first saw it, it didn't really leave much of a mark. A few shots stood out, like the man in the coffin opening his eyes, or that weird walk he does along the wall. But the more films I see now, the more I'm pulled to the ones that remind me of that one. The one that supposedly started it all. The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Werner Krauss plays a stranger, a man who arrives into town under the guise of an exhibitionist at a fair. Two young men, Francis and Alan, who happen to be in love with the same woman, come across this Caligari in his curiosity act, a sleepwalker named Caesar. He tells the crowd that Caesar can predict the future and invites anyone to ask him a question. Alan, braver than most, volunteers. How long will I live? He asks. The answer is sooner than he expected. The next morning, when Francis finds the body of his friend, he immediately suspects Caligari. That night, he follows him to his home and keeps a careful watch through a window. When he sees Caesar lying in bed, his worries are slightly abated, but we quickly realize that this Caesar is a fake, and that the real one is on the hunt. The killer is after Jane, the woman Francis loves. After a chase through the streets of this fictional town, Jane is saved and Caesar dies of exhaustion. Knowing who is really responsible, Francis goes to the town doctor to convince him of the true kidnapper, only to find that Caligari and the doctor are the same person. The film ends with an even bigger twist. Francis is insane and has been kept in an asylum where all these fantasies he has exist only in his head. It turns out the doctor is actually the one who's going to cure him. It's interesting to note that the original script for Caligari is different from the final film. After Eric Palmer, the head of the major film studio UFA, agreed to make the movie, it was first offered to Fritz Lang, the man who would later direct Metropolis and M. He turned it down due to scheduling conflicts, but offered one key change to the script that was later accepted by the director, Robert Vina. He added two scenes, one at the beginning and one at the end, that bookend the story within the framework of a lunatic in a mental hospital. This changes Janowitz and Mayer's original intentions wildly. Instead of the main authority figure being a crazed, string-pulling puppet master, it's the common man who's crazy, 
and only his perception of the sensible savior that's twisted and warped. The authors were incensed, but as hard as they fought to have their version restored, Vina and the studio felt the movie needed to end on a more audience-pleasing note if it were to do well financially. It turns out they were right. Dr. Caligari was a huge hit all over the world. Critics praised it for its bold style, dark themes, and general artistry. It became a new cinematic benchmark, and for the next few years would lead at the forefront of what we now know as German Expressionism. Before the First World War, there was hardly a film industry to speak of in Germany. Most of the movies that played in movie houses were imports from overseas. Westerns and detective stories were especially popular even more than the American comedy giants like Buster Keaton and Harold Lloyd. For a crowd that was more likely to laugh at the folly of man's suffering, the luck-heavy, happy endings of Keaton and Lloyd didn't exactly align with German audiences. There was one exception in the humor department, a German-born director named Ernst Lubitsch, who started his career as an actor, but gradually shifted his focus behind the camera. His comedies and costume dramas would become some of the most popular domestic movies released in the 1910s. Later, he would move to Hollywood and cement his legacy as a master. But that's another story. Things took a turn once the war began. Like the rest of the world, Germany became very aware of what went across its borders. Movies from France and the US stopped coming in. But with all the stress and worry of daily life, demand was higher than ever. Suddenly, the national industry was booming. Studios were churning out all kinds of pictures, and people flocked to see them. One of the most common releases was, of course, the war film but not just for Germany. As the years went on and things continued to escalate, international film became increasingly anti-German, especially in America. Pretty soon movies weren't just being made to entertain. Propaganda had found its way onto the big screen. The German government quickly realized the power of this new art form, and so in 1917, they rallied all the disparate studios they had together to form one major one, UFA. Their goal? To counter all enemy propaganda with their own. Most of the films that came out during this time are now gone. However, there are a few worth mentioning. In his book From Caligari to Hitler, written in 1947, Siegfried Krakauer notes four films that laid the groundwork for the big hits Germany would produce in the coming years. The Student of Prague, The Other, Homunculus, and The Gollum. My personal favorite is The Gollum. While the others feel primitive and overly theatrical, this one still holds up visually. Some of the shots of rooms or stairs are actually impressive. Their designs seem carefully made for those specific frames. And the story of the man-made monster is now a staple of the horror genre, and one that I quite like. The version of The Gollum that exists today is actually the third part of a trilogy, a prequel to the original film. It came out in 1920, the same year as Caligari. Both films were very popular at the time, even in New York, where they played to sold-out crowds for months straight, which I think says something about audiences back then. They were drawn to well-made movies. I believe it had less to do with what they were about than how they chose to tell their stories. They were doing something different, pushing the art form in a new direction, and it was interesting and exciting. It still is. When it comes to expressionism, there are two kinds of shadows. One is literally painted into the sets, permanent, unmoving. They're not there to fool you, but to draw attention to themselves, to this false reality that may not exist for us, but exists for the characters that live inside them. It's a harsh reality. Alleys twist and curve like a maze. Buildings loom like dead trees. Street lamps throw light down at sharp, impossible angles. This is not the safe, soft, haloed glow of Hollywood. This is the inner pain and confusion of a war-torn country trying to figure itself out. The other shadow is a historical one. Movies have this power unlike any other creative medium, which is the ability to communicate ideas on a mass scale. While books and paintings are the products of individuals, movies are made by teams with large audiences in mind. They can be experienced by thousands of people in a single showing. That's why someone like Krakauer can look back and say that by studying what audiences saw, you can catch a glimpse of an entire nation's dreams and concerns. So, what were the dreams and concerns of Germany in the early 1920s? Die Zeit nach dem Ersten Weltkrieg war für Deutschland eine Zeit der tiefsten Verzweiflung, der Hysterie, des Zynismus, 
des ungezügelten Lasters. Entsetzliche Armut war neben ganz großem und neuem Reichtum. According to Krakauer, the villains of Caligari and Dr. Mabus foreshadowed the rise of Hitler. They were tyrants, and, as evil as they were, offered an alternative to chaos. In a way, these movies can be seen as a battle of wills, a way of exercising social and political fears. Whether or not this is a valid psychological assessment or an after-the-fact reading of history is up to the viewer, but I'll let the filmmaker speak for his own work. Man hat mir oft unterstellt, dass Dr. Mabuse das Prototyp des Diktators war, dass ich Hitler vorausgesehen habe. Das stimmt nicht. Für mich war Dr. Mabuse ein Übermensch. Irgendwo der Nietzsche Übermensch im schlechten Sinn gesehen. Dr. Mabuse came out in 1922, the same year as another expressionist classic, Nosferatu. As different as the plots and even filmmaking approaches are between them, the movies that were made in Germany between 1920 and 1924 capture this specific darkness, this inner turmoil in a way that few other film movements have since. They weren't just stylized for style's sake, they were extensions, expressions of a haunted people. The first thing that people think of when they think of expressionism is theatricality. The predominant use of sets instead of locations, the many spotlights and irises, the over-the-top performances where characters portrayed not through the face but through the whole body. Part of this was because it was in line with the artistic sensibility of the time, but part of it was also practical. After the war, the entire country retreated into itself. The industry was no different. Studios became such an integral part of film production that one writer of the time called the whole movement studio constructivism. After the success of Caligari, theaters started pulling from the movies, when it was the theater that was the major influence in the first place. A man named Max Reinhardt is worth mentioning here. He was famous for developing his own style on the German stage during the 1910s. Many of the actors who would play a part in the Expressionist movies actually came from his theater troupe. Audiences knew him from nightly performances, where every night there was a different show. Although Reinhardt never considered himself an Expressionist, his use of lighting and shadow became his signature. He used spotlights to dramatically highlight actors, and shadows to simulate larger crowds than there really were. Lighting became even more important towards the end of the war, as money grew tighter and less of the budget could be allocated to sets, which were also a major part of his theater. Once the script for Caligari had been approved by the studio, director Vina hired three expressionist painters to design the sets for the film. Herman Worm, the art director, who would later work with Fritz Lang and Carl Dreyer, took his sketches and blew them up to human size, so it looks like the actors are literally walking inside of a drawing. Other directors were less exaggerated. In Nosferatu, F.W. Murnau used real locations, a rare practice at the time. But his deliberate choice of framing highlights the mood of the scene more than the physical spaces in which they're set. Fritz Lang was similar. He used lights to accentuate certain architectural details and reliefs. He pushed reality, but not beyond the physical boundaries of our world. What ties all these films together is their inward focus. Ultimately, they are outer manifestations of some inner mental or emotional state, whether it's of a madman, a vampire, or a gambler. Germans have always had this fascination with the fantastical. We create fairy tales because we prefer to populate the monstrous emptiness and horrid chaos, says poet Ludwig Tieck. Tales of terror are told to children, and they are met with giddiness and glee. As the centuries go by, it moves from one medium to another. Films took over plays and books, but the blood of history is in them all. War met the movies, and the result was a dead man opening his eyes in a coffin. I just want to say thank you to everyone who has subscribed so far. At the time of recording this, um, this channel has almost 1,000 subscribers, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I'll be continuing to make these videos, I hope, for the next year. So if you're interested, uh, consider subscribing and uh, yeah, we'll see you soon.